So welcome. Um, and several of you are here from the uh, class that I teach on high performance computing, where we talked about Schwartz methods uh, just this Thursday. Uh, so today's speaker is going to be talking about Schwartz methods, but in the case of asynchronous computing, uh, which is a hot topic uh, again now. It, it was a hot topic in the 80s um, and, and has come back to life because communication is so much more expensive now and the, the gap between communication costs and computation costs just keeps growing. Um, Daniel Schilm is uh, an eminent figure in numerical linear algebra. Um, I think I first met him at uh, when I was at the start of graduate school at, at some point, maybe at the maybe at a householder meeting or at a science linear algebra meeting, um, but got to know him also uh, through uh, electronic transactions on numerical analysis. He was one of the editors in chief for a good time, um, and is now um, the editor in chief for Cymax and uh, the vice president at large for uh, one of the vice presidents at large. Uh, yeah, the one. There's only one, yes, uh, of, of SIAM, um, as well as maintaining a very active research program at Temple University. So it's my pleasure to welcome him today. Well, thank you, David. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for the invitation and for giving me a chance to tell you something. Uh, there's only one vice president at large because during the year that there is no president-elect, if the president dies, the president, the vice president becomes president. It never happened, and I hope it never happens. <laughs> uh, this is joint work with uh, Frédéric Magoules from Ecole Centrale in Paris, and his former student, Cédric Benet. And uh, it's a project we started on uh, asynchronous optimized Schwartz methods. So uh, I'm going to go backwards and give you a five minute introduction of Schwartz methods. And then I'm going to give you another five minutes on optimized Schwartz methods. And then I'll tell you a little bit about asynchronous Schwartz methods. And tell you about a couple of theorems we think we proved. <laughs> and then give you some numerical example. And uh, I encourage you to interrupt me anytime for anything, okay? Please. Okay, so uh, Schwartz method. So I, this is very general. I have a differential equation and some boundary conditions. So your favorite stuff, the simplest thing you can think of, the Laplacian if you want, or anything more complicated. And some boundary conditions on the domain, okay? So Schwartz, in 1860, he said, okay, I know how to solve a PV on a rectangle, and I know how to solve a PV <coughs> on a circle. Do there exist solutions of the PV on a union? That was his question. So he was looking for existence and uniqueness of solutions of PV. And the way he proved that such solution exists, which is what we do now in a different context, he said, okay, well, the union is this looking glass type shape. And then what's inside are kind of artificial boundaries. If I have these conditions outside, okay, so let me invent some value here. Now I can solve the PDE here. Once I finish, I have some values for this. Okay, now I have boundary conditions for this, I know how to solve that. Of course, I have different values for the overlap. The solution from here is not the same as the solution from here. And he said, okay, well now that I solve this, I have new values from here. Let me solve again. And then solve again, and then solve again. And he proved that this converges. Therefore, the solution here, which is both from the left and from the right, is the same, bingo, we have existence and uniqueness. This is 1870. Okay, so 20 years ago or 30 years ago, people say, uh, Jacques Louis-Guillon, to be precise, said, okay, well I can do this to solve numerically. 
And we call this alternative Schwarz method. Of course, it doesn't have to be this shape. It doesn't have to be anything that I know. This is just an example. So let me repeat, OK? The general idea is I have two domains. So let, let me turn my cell phone off so that once I was in a wedding in a church, and the phone rings, and everyone started to look left and right. Who, who is this? Who is this? It was the groom's phone who was ringing. So. <laughs> OK, so let me repeat. <coughs> I have this domain that has a funny shape, whatever shape for your domain is. Here is 2D, but it could be 3D, it could be anything. And then I want to solve this. So I'm going to invent what I call artificial interfaces. They're not there. The problem doesn't have these boundaries in between. So I invent. And I draw them here vertically, but they can have any shape you want. Uh, sometimes they can be overlapping, which is useful, but they don't have to be. Okay. So that's what I do. It's an alternative method. I solve on the left domain using some initial values from here, and I have Dirich left conditions for everything. I can solve this. Then once I do that, I have values from here. I use those to solve this the problem on the right. And I alternate on these conversions. So I can do this numerically. Okay. So what do I need? I need to invent the artificial interfaces. I just program it. Boom. It's not very hard. OK. You can do this for any number of subdomains. I just gave you two. I mean, the simplest way is you have your domain that you have, you take what's called a one-way partition with the vertical stripes. No, no stripes. Strips. Strips. OK? Of course, you can have what's called cross points. You can just say squared, and the same applies. And you can do overlap. And then the question is, which order you do this? Alternating, you fix an order, you just go around. This works. OK? OK, you can say, OK, I have P subdomains. I go from the beginning to end. I call that one sweep. This is a very good preconditioner for Kilo subspace methods. And in fact, that's what's mostly how it's used nowadays. This is called multiplicative Schwartz as a preconditioner. So alternating Schwartz is what I shall show you. And, uh, Multiplicative Schwartz, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, Multiplicative Schwartz is when I use it as a precondition. Okay? Clear question? All right. There's something called additive Schwartz, which is mostly as a precondition. And you can reinterpret this. So, what we just did of doing one sweep is essentially like block Jacobi with overlap. Except now you have overlap between the blocks which corresponds to the subdomains. So we know how this converges. This is an iterative method. We know that it converges linearly, and the rate of convergence asymptotically is the speckle radius of the iteration matrix. OK? Or the norm, if you have a norm. If you show that it's less than 1, that's the rate. OK? OK. Uh, now, Schwarz method domain decomposition is a huge field. I listed here a few of the books that I like. Uh, the domain decomposition at the beginning was meeting every year. Now, for the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years or something, they're meeting every 18 months. It's a funny thing. So they meet like in July and then in January the next year. So last meeting was a few months ago in the island of Jeju, which is kind of halfway between Korea and China, in the middle of there. And the next meeting in January of 2017, apparently will be in the north, most known part of Norway, where it's 24 hour dark. <laughs> <laughs> so my former advisor, Bidlund, who is very active in the domain composition, I said, why did they choose that? He said, I don't know, I abstained on the vote, but the problem is not the dark. Dark is OK. You can see the lights. It's interesting. But you cannot go to the woods because there are very hungry bears. 
but you can rent the rifle at the grocery store. <laughs> okay, so Schwartz and the medical position. So that was your five minute introduction review. So let's talk about Optima Schwartz. Okay, so we're inventing the artificial boundaries. So why do we have to do Dirichlet? Even though outside is Dirichlet, I can put some other boundary conditions. It's all my choice. So people say, why don't I use Robin or Robin boundary conditions, in which I have a linear combination of Dirichlet and Neumann. And I have one parameter, and I can change that parameter, and I can do an optimization, find the best parameter to have the spectral radius of the iteration operator be as small as possible. It will be linear, but faster. And this is called optimized Schwartz. You see? In one minute, you know everything. Okay, well, some people say, well, what if I do two parameters? <laughs> then I can presumably do better. And you do, it's more expensive, you do more things, but people do this. Okay, until recently, the only way to find these parameters, I mean, how, do you, how are you gonna find these parameters? You have to write your problem, now you have an optimization problem that involves a lot of stuff. It's plus the spectral radius of the iteration operator that involves your PDE. And then you want to find the minimum. <laughs> and until recently, okay. The traditional tools are Fourier analysis. So you can only apply this to rectangular domains or half spheres. And people do that, did that, and then they find the optimal for that particular PD for this domain, and then they say, okay, this is the number I got, I'm gonna use it for another domain that is not a rectangular, but close or whatever. And it works. It's not the optimal, but it's the optimal for a nearby problem of some sort. Uh, and more recently, using some theory that I don't understand about covariance and things that now people say automatically, okay, here's my domain and crank up and we have software and now you get the, the optimal parameters for both these two cases and other cases perhaps. So it's available. Okay. In addition, if you forget the PDE, Okay, so you have your PDE, you do the domain decomposition, you do the overlap, you discretize final elements, whatever you like, and now you have a linear system, okay? And then we say, well, can we mimic this? I'm gonna solve the linear system using, for example, gas either with overlap. Can I mimic this and find the optimal parameters, whatever that means, and the answer is yes. And here's an example from a paper from a few years ago uh, in which this is essentially block outside there with no overlap. This is with overlap. So if you don't know anything and if you don't want to remember much, one message here is overlap is very cheap and it gets you a lot. So if you're doing anything with anything, think overlap. Every iteration costs you a little bit more, but the red color conversions is so much faster that it's worth it, okay? And then these other lines are algebraically different versions of this optimized with certain parameter. But there's something that is optimal, which is this. In two iterations, it converges. So if you really are willing to spend the computational effort to get the right stuff, it's gonna converge into iterations. Because it's two subdomains. If you can do red-black ordering in many subdomains, it's still two iterations. But if you can't and you have a complicated structure that the P subdomains, you cannot do red-black ordering, it will converge at most in P subdomains. It's really like a direct method. If you're gonna converge in two steps, it's intrinsically a direct method. And actually, there's a proof why it has to do with the should complement the, with a disc discrete version of some kind of three to Neumann map. It's all understood. 
And if you don't have the optimal, optimal, you approximate, okay, instead of two, it's gonna be five iterations. Ah, uh, all right. So, Optima Schwartz, it's an industry in itself. I just want to point out that there are many people who have worked on this and they continue to work on this. We are not inventing anything new, just that it exists. We have done the algebraic version. Si, senor. Um, the matching up of boundary conditions. Yes. Uh, this happens pointwise along that strip? Yes. Okay, so you're solving a unique problem at every, every separate no, you solve for you solve for the whole subdomain, okay. and then you take whatever information on all those boundary points at once. Okay. So in this case, I solve this differential equation with these boundary values. Then I have all my subdomain information, and then I pick these values, which I obtain. And the original PDE itself is second order. Anything you like. So far, it's very general. Okay, you have to have existence, uniqueness, the right smoothness, the right boundary conditions. Okay? So, if you have P subdomains, we talk about the local problem, which means the problem of the subdomain. Okay? Okay, so let's. Uh, Let's consider a very big omega. And I'm going to have one-way partition. They don't have to be vertical, OK? So this is omega 1, this is omega 2, this is omega 3, and so forth, OK? But locally, I'm looking at one of them. This is my omega s, s from 1 to p. And sometimes I call this the rest, okay? Because locally I only see the rest, I don't see exactly my neighbor. Okay? And these uh, gammas are my uh, interfaces, artificial interfaces. So this is gamma right for omega s, gamma left for omega s, so this would be the right for the s minus one and this would be the left for the s plus one, okay? So this is now a general view of optimal Schwartz, where this gamma is my operator, which could be alpha u for O0, or it could be have two terms, or it could be anything else. It's just very general. So in each subdomain, I solve my differential equation in the boundary that corresponds to the big omega, I use my Dirichlet boundary conditions. And on my left and right, I use the value of the previous iterate. Okay, so now I answer your question formally. Okay? Okay, so how do I do this? I go one, I do the sweep, I finish. If I'm, if I'm omega s, I do mine, I write my information, and then I finish, and then I wait till everyone finish, and then I start again. Okay? Uh, and as I said, if we have optimal conditions that have to do with this, this layer not my map or skeletal Poincare map, if you do one sweep, you finish. Of course, this computation is unfeasible because these are non local computations but it's optimal, could be optimal. Now, I want to rethink this as a fixed point problem from the boundaries into the boundaries. Because I solved this, I, hold, I solved this problem, and when I finish, all I need is the boundary points. This information is local. So I can think of a map that takes the boundary points from my neighbors, and when I finish, I spit out the boundary points that my neighbors need. I repeat. Here, okay, so when do I start, what do I do? I start by using as input 
my left and right from the previous, from the point star S, from my, my left and right from the N iteration. I solve for this and when I finish, I write this information and I'm done. So it's a map from boundary values into boundary values. Now the map consists of solving a PDE locally, a restriction of your operator to your local subdomain. But it's a map, I can think of this as a map that takes boundary values into boundary values. And what's the map doing? It solves this um, PDE locally with my boundary values. When I finish, I write my results. Okay? So now, I have a fixed point problem, and it's optimized just because I'm using this operator that, ho op that has these parameters that I try to minimize. <laughs> Clear? Okay? Okay, and I repeat. I can, I can do this in parallel. If I have P subdomains, I can do P processors. Each of them will take the boundary values will solve what they have to do, they finish the write. But then I cannot start again until all the other boundary values that I'm going to use have a, have a write. So there's this synchronization point. Okay, so the proposal is to do it asynchronously. Okay, so let's situate ourselves in one processor, a processor S. I do this fixed point map. I take the boundary values, after my computation, I solve my PDE locally, I finish, and I have my boundary value to write to the, that other people will use. And instead of waiting, I start again. So in the process, some boundary, va boundary values may have arrived from one side but not the other. Maybe everything came, maybe everything came already twice. Maybe one didn't come but the other came twice. I don't care, I start again. Now the concept of iteration loses its meaning. So we call this updates. So I start, I finish, I do my update, then I do it again the next round, then I do it again the next round. Now, it's wonderful except that intuitively, why would this work? <laughs> okay? So okay, so here is formally, I just get whatever I have, I solve, I finish, I start again, okay? That is the long history, as David alluded from the 80s, in which people work on this, especially for fixed point problems. And uh, some important names are here. There is a very nice book by Bertzekas and Tisiklis. There's a more recent book by Jacques Bahi, in which he solved an important problem, which is when do you stop? If everything is asynchronous, and there are no iterations, when do you stop? And there were always several papers Singer had to do, but then he had to synchronize anyway. The way he does it, essentially, is he said, okay, let, let me tell you the paradigm. I'm my processor, I can compute some local residuals. If my local residual is small, I say, okay, my local residual is small, then I send the information, and then everyone checks, but that's not enough. Okay, so uh, anyway, so there is a way of sending information and having a second sweep, and by then, you know, everyone has a, the global residual is more enough. Si, senor. So throughout, we should think about the local solves as being done to high accuracy or with a direct solve, or are you going to talk about uh, cases where you're using a different method internally? Uh, either way, <laughs> either way. So, so right now, okay, so I'll show you experiments at the end. In my experiments, we just do direct solvers. Just because I have 500 processors, I have 20 million unknowns, you just divide and it's small enough that, boom, a few thousand variables. But, but you could do an iterative methods locally, yes. Uh, okay, um, so one result that uh, we use, uh, 
this is essentially due to delta uh, So if you have a fixed point problem and your operator is contracting using some norm, then under some very mild conditions that have to do such as you cannot use information that will exist in the future, for example. You cannot use information that was computed in the past. Such minimal conditions. Then the asynchronous, then this method will converge to the unique fixed point of this map. So a lot of the proofs have to do with finding the right norm for which your operator is contracted. I can say it in any, another way that I like to say it. If the synchronous problem converges, then the asynchronous problem will converge. If the asynchronous problem does not converge, there is no hope that the asynchronous will converge. <laughs> okay? Okay. So, what we did is, in two different situations, we had these one-way splittings, and we showed that this asynchronous optimal Schwartz method will converge. The first theorem, which is more theoretical, is taking this kind of uh, general PDEs and show that if you use the <coughs> optimal conditions which you cannot really compute, in theory this will converge. Okay, so that's good because if, if in the best case you couldn't prove it, then you couldn't prove it in the practical cases. And then in the practical case, well, I don't know how practical it is, but we take the Laplacian operator on the whole plane, and we're able to prove that this will converge. Okay? So let me be more specific for this problem. So we have the Laplacian on the plane, and we are going to take <coughs> vertical strips. Okay, so the left most is some value that goes to minus infinity <laughs> with overlap, okay? So this is my right most, this is to infinity, and this is my left most of, of my next one, say, and then continue like this, and then this, there, there, like this. A piece of domains. Okay, and really the, the width of these subdomains could be anything, but it's easier for the proofs that they have the same width. It doesn't really matter. We can do it for a general case, but for simplicity, we assume that except for the first and the last, they all have the same width. Okay, so I'm gonna solve local problems. So I'm going to restrict my f to my local subdomain and my, so I'm going to solve Laplacian equal fs in omega s. Okay. Okay. So this is the same thing as we did before, but now in detail. So on the first subdomain, which is the leftmost, I solve the local problem, and I have this... Uh, Robin type boundary conditions. So remember, these are vertical boundaries, so the normal is the same as the x direction. So this is normal, plus alpha u, say, in the simplest case. See? Do we have conditions on x? It has to do only with, in terms of the, your original PDE. It has to be smooth enough so that your original PDE has the right solution. Then everything carries on to your subdomain. Okay, so we're assuming that f is a smooth function. Smooth enough so your Laplacian has a solution, yes. Okay. And then in any of the other intermediate domains, you want to solve this local problem, and you have on the left and the right, uh, you have the boundary conditions appropriately, and the same for there, okay? So this is the synchronous problem, if you want, okay? And then again, we do this 
um, we think of this uh, fixed point problem that maps boundary condition, boundary values to boundary values on these vertical lines. And now my asynchronous problem is as before. Essentially, I take right and left, but now I don't have n plus one again. <coughs> I just use my updates. I do this asynchronous. Okay? <coughs> All right, so this is the statement of the theorem, or part of the statement of the theorem. So I have my uh, gamma here, which could be alpha u, okay? And then I do a uh, Fourier transform in the y direction, and I call lambda of k the Fourier transform of my operator for each frequencies, okay? And then here are my two assumptions that for each frequency, this Fourier value is not minus absolute value, and uh, this on the left is less than this on the right. I'm gonna to talk to, uh, to you about these conditions in a minute. If this is satisfied, then I can prove that the asynchronous methods will converge. Or in other words, that there's no magic. I can prove that this works, that it will converge. And, uh, for any initial values that you choose, which is the standard, okay? Okay, so let's talk about the conditions. So, uh, so if I have the standard Robin, the Fourier transform is as alpha, or alpha plus beta k squared, or k is my, my frequency. So in our experiments, we always use alpha and beta positive, so it can never happen. So these two lambdas are always positive, so it can never be minus the absolute value of the frequency. So I'm covered. Okay? No problem. Now for this, okay, so this is, uh, a number less than one assuming that I have some overlap, okay. And this number is also less than one. Okay. So, okay, so this number is less than one. Now, what about this number? This number is also less than one because it's one minus something or one plus something. And, but, it's a increasing function of W. So okay, so if I make W large enough, this will be satisfied. So if my this is infinite, right? So I have P minus one blocks, so I have to make them wide enough. So so these holes then is perfectly satisfied. So there are restrictions, but not they're not really restrictions. Also this is the whole plane. Your problem probably would be different. But for this problem, we can prove that it works. Now, of course, most of the real problems are three-dimensional. This is a two-dimensional proof. It's the best we could do. And I like this proof very much. I'm not going to show it to you. But it uses, it uses this Fourier transform, functional analysis, a lot of linear algebra. And at the end, it uses this maximum uh, weight norm to prove that this operator is contracting. So, it's fun. So let me give you some experiments. Si senor, si senor. So, uh, Lei Xing Ying and uh, Dorn Enquist had this method where they were using uh, outgoing boundary conditions. Um, so, so some sort of radiation boundary conditions yes. at the edge of their subdomains for their salt. So in that case, you've got the something that looks a little bit like a Robin condition, but you've got a complex coefficients involved. Does your proof carry over for that case too, or it, is it, it there? Okay. Uh, not directly, but it, we may have to do some work. So this is for the Laplacia. We are working on Helmholtz and on Maxwell, for, so it has more different number of variables and things. And the proofs don't carry over exactly, so 
we'll see what kind of other tools we need to use. So the answer is not exactly, but we'll something good to look into. Si, sí, senor. Yes. Sure. Okay, let's talk about that. <coughs> you think of rate conversions because you're thinking of iterations. But here we don't have, we, don't, we no longer have iterations. So, so there is no rate of conversions. You can compare CPU times, and I will. So you can prove rate of conversions for the synchronous case. Then you can run the synchronous case and it will converge in 100 seconds. Then you run the asynchronous case and it will converge in 70 seconds. Therefore, therefore, it's not true what I'm going to say, but you can say, well, it's faster than this for which I know that this is the rate of conversions. Let me say something else. If you want to think of iterations, which you shouldn't, but if you want to think of iteration, if you're hard-headed, then you will always you should think that this will converge slower than the synchronous case. In terms of, if the synchronous case will, will needs 100 iterations, and then in this a synchronous case you can count iterations, but you can count local iterations. Some processor will take 120 steps. How many will take 150 steps? And I may take 140 steps. There will always be a larger number than if it were synchronous. Now, this is not strictly true, and if I, we have one example here in which the number, so, so I'll report here to you minimum and maximum because I have you know, 500 processors and they all have different number of updates. I'll give you minimum and maximum, we can also do averages and things. Compare them with the, and in some cases, for a subtle reason that we can discuss, you may have fewer the minimum may be fewer than the synchronous because you may get faster information. This, the, the spectral radius is of a different operator, let's say. Okay. Uh, just a second. I told you that if the synchronous work, then you, in some cases, you can prove the asynchronous will work. If the synchronous doesn't work, okay. But if the synchronous work, you cannot expect any concept of convergence rate to be faster than synchronous. But we cannot think of that way because now we are thinking architecture. We're thinking of communication. We're thinking of CPU times. And when you think of that, then that's where your advantage comes. Not from the number of iterations, not how fast it goes, but how fast your clock time and CPU time is. So if you have two methods, which are synchronous and one is faster than the other, then one would say, although I have no proof, that when you go to asynchronous, the one that is faster will be faster. But I have no proof for that. All I can say is that both will work. Maybe one can figure out the proof using some comparisons, but I'm not sure. Yes, correct, because your, your problem is, in theory, asynchronous, but it will be exactly synchronous because everyone is going to finish at the same time. But that assumes that communication is free. If you have perfect load balancing and communication is free, then it's true. But communication is not free, and therefore, the answer is no. Right. And so you have to wait. So I, I've often wondered if it would be good to do like a multi-thread step to stop during the subdomain or during the sub uh, the outer short salt, spread some information around, and start up again. Okay. So I can tell you what I think of that. So that's a hybrid method. 
you do some synchronization and some asynchronous part. And in principle, it's okay. And it may be faster than doing all synchronous, but it may be slower than doing all asynchronous. Because once you synchronize, then you lose the capacity to of using your processors effectively. It depends on the problem. And we are thinking forward, okay? So now I'm, I'm gonna t tell you about 500 processors, but we really want to think about 500,000 processors. Si, si, si. Yes. Okay, but le let me stop you there. You're also assuming implicitly that every processor is the same as every other processor. No. Okay. So, so even if you have load balancing and the processors are all different, it's like having no balancing. Right. If you have an airplane, you, you want a wing, so we. For my proof. No, 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 no. It's so that I can use my proof. Doesn't mean that I need it for conversions. It may be that there's a clever, more clever proof that doesn't need that. <laughs> yeah, okay, go ahead. Yes. No, no, the way I think about it is in the, I think of it in the regular Schwartz domain decomposition literature in which, so there's a beautiful paper called to overlap or not to overlap, for example. How much to overlap? The more you overlap, the faster the information is gonna go, but it's more expensive, there's always a compromise. So I go with that. And if my problem has a natural domain decomposition because of the, like if it's an airplane, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna take a piece of this, the wing and the fuselage, I'm gonna have the wing and the fuselage, for, okay? Then I'm gonna go for the geometry plus a, minim, a minimum overlap of say one or two mesh points, depending on what kind of final elements you're using. And usually I'm going to match the number of subdomains with the number of processors. Or if the problem warrants it, I may use fewer processors because the shapes are better or depending on. So no, I don't see any contradiction. And don't take that seriously that my W has to be wide enough. That's just to show that this condition holds it, the, the implication is in one direction. If I have that, I can prove it. That doesn't mean that, and I can only prove it for the plane in 2D, I'm gonna show you 3D calculations for which there is no proof. Okay, I have a proof for 2D for the whole plane. So it seems like, uh, you know, when, when reasoning about uh, convergence and, uh, you know, worst case scenarios, uh, load balancing here is, is very important, right? Because if you have like, you know, one guy who's doing like one iteration and then one other guy who's doing like 200, then really bad things are gonna happen. The whole point of this is that bad things are not going to happen. And if you have CPUs and GPUs, they're gonna be so different. Well, so, so you're still gonna converge, but you're just gonna convert really slowly in that case, right? Is that the, that's the intuition? Look, you work with what you have. Uh, the whole point of this is, if you're gonna spend two months trying to do a lot of balancing to gain 5%, forget it, just run it, 
and get 30% with asynchronous. Okay, so let me show you one experiment. Uh, so the second thing you may remember from this talk is Shikshulu. That's the name of the crater in Yucatan that was formed by the asteroid 66 million years ago that was partially responsible <coughs> for the extinction of the dinosaurs. Uh, Shikshulub is not Spanish, it's Maya. Okay? So it's the name of the, this town, and it's approximately 120 miles, 180 kilometers diameter. And uh, so this is a an artist rendition from the from NASA that took different measurements. So this is the coast, and this you can see these shapes that hint that this happened. These white dots are sinkholes. In Spanish, they're called cenotes, and these are I don't know if any one of you have been to Yucatan or swam. These are huge ponds going very deep in the middle of the rock, and there are hundreds of them. And it's just go there and people go sleep. But it, it's part of the story, okay? So we want to uh, compute the gravitational potential in this region. So we make this uh, fine element mesh on a pizza box shape that is graded, so it's not uniform. So it's 200 by 250, 250 by 250 kilometers and 15 kilometers deep. Discretized, and uh, and we want to solve a Laplacian, for which I proved something in in a in a different context. This is three D, and we have to compute all these quantities that some of which are constants that we know, and some come from measurements that people have done. Uh, and we have a computer Laplacian. And this is part of the geometry. This is, so this is the pizza enlarged like this. This is part of the final element mesh. As, as my colleague said, this is to show that it's a real board problem and not just a toy thing. <laughs> okay, so they have a, I'm gonna show you uh, four cases really, but three different discretizations. Uh, 300,000 nodes, two and a half million nodes, and about 20 million nodes. And on purpose, I'm choosing a homogeneous network of processors because my expectation is that if they're inhomogeneous, this is going to work better because I have less load balancing. So I'm choosing kind of the best or the worst, if you like. If it's going to work for this, then it should work for the other case as well. Except we haven't run it in, like, we run it in a different kind of machine, so I can't compare them. So I'm going to run the regular synchronous optimized Schwartz with the parameters that I get from this software. And it's the same parameters in both synchronous and asynchronous runs. And as we discussed, in each subdomain, I just solve directly. OK, so here is all of the, CP, all of the iterations and CPU time. So this is number of iterations. I can say this because these are iterations. This is CPU time in the synchronous case. And this is the updates. I should redo my slides and call it updates. Minimum and maximum for each case. So if you see, it's always smaller, about 30%. And uh, so for your 20 million variables, you run it, you go get coffee, you come back, it's finished, 10 minutes. Uh, this is a machine in France, it's pool, and uh, okay, so the magic works. Uh, all right, so just, just to show some result that resembles what we expect to be, just, uh, you take a slice at five kilometers down, and this is the gravitational potential that we get from the data we have. All right, so uh, 
I gave you an introduction to asynchronous parallel optimized fast methods, uh, both some theory and some experiments. Uh, they work. They should think about them if you have a similar problem or a different problem. Uh, don't expect to gain an order of magnitude. Okay. You will gain an order of magnitude if you have a larger problem and if you have many more processors. But for this number of processors, that's what's reasonable. Uh, there's a report on my website if you want to read the proof or other things. Okay, there is a stopping criteria. In the past, what people do, as I said, is they say, okay, I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to uh, send messages between processors. And when all the processors have locally converged, then I stop, I, don't st I stop provisionally, then I check my global thing, and if this is, I do a second test, and then I stop. That's what they used to do. Now there's a better way, which I don't fully know, but I know where to find it, which is which does two sweeps. I start, everyone co everyone agrees, and then again there is a second sweep in which this, everyone agrees again, and then I stop. And they can guarantee that globally have converged. So you just arbitrarily, you arbitrarily run that test after? Uh, no, I think it's generated by any of, it, gener it starts with any of the processors that have converged locally, then you can start. So I'm not going to stop to start. I'm just going to wait until some of the processors give me the signal. I'm done here. So I, I don't fully can explain it to you, but I know it works. And I know, actually, in, in, by his book, it's well explained. Okay, so uh, for David's sake. So I, I, one of the things I'm known for is Krillov subspace methods. Well, there's no Krillov methods here. Well, you could solve the local problems in a Krillov method. That's fine. And actually, as David said, this was hot in the 80s. We wrote this survey in 2000, and no one has used this for a long time. Partly because people say, well, all you can do is block Jacobi. <laughs> and we know block Jacobi is not that fast. So, so the difference now is that block Jacobi is not that fast, but block Jacobi with overlap with the optimal parameters is very fast. So I'm going to be slower, but I'm going to be slower than something that is very fast. <coughs> and. Um, and people ask me, well, can you use this as a preconditioner? The optimized, sorry, the synchronous version can be used as a preconditioner. You can say the low tolerance, and that's a preconditioner. Any iterative method can be accelerated with the Kirov acceleration. The problem is you have to fix the tolerance appropriately. And in the synchronous case, that makes sense. In the asynchronous case, you can do the same, but then you lose the synchronicity, then you have to do your inner products. And for 500 processors, it's okay. But if you're gonna go to 500,000 processors, I think it's hopeless. So they're synchronous, maybe the way of thinking for the future. Thank you very much. So there were a lot of questions along the way, but we still have time for one. So you, you keep talking about, okay, if you scale up to 500,000 processors, but if you scale up to 500,000 processors, uh, that's the point at which you, you might want to start doing multi-grid types of things in order to move your data across the processor level mesh more quickly. Do these, have you thought about, uh, so, so far you're just uh, talking about doing one level. Uh, one level. Right. 
Is it possible to do the the asynchronous stuff where you're splitting not yes. just in space? Okay, so, so this is one way I like to think about it. And this comes from my algebraic mind. So I work in algebraic versions of Schwartz, in which the coarse grid correction is just one more block, which picks pieces from the different blocks. So I can think of it that way. And yes, I can assign one block to be the coarse grid and do the same asynchronously. And it's in my list of to-do things, <laughs> but yes. So that's how I think about it. You can give a second level if you properly choose the course grid correction in the same way. The same way you would do it for Schwartz. And algebraically it means you, well, you will solve your PDE on a domain that is cells everywhere. Your domain is, is no longer this, it would be many pieces. Well, it's a course grid. And then you can do that synchronously with the rest. We have to prove that it works. Presumably it's faster. Probably it's just you have to do experiments. I would put it in my proposal. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, uh, so, so you mentioned like communication voiding stuff, but how is this avoiding communication? <coughs> is this just avoiding synchronization? Well, you don't avoid the communication, but you don't have to wait for it. Yeah, so just the synchronization. That's right. Okay. Cool. The communication is the same. Yeah. Well, in fact, you will have more communication, except that is overlay over your computation. So okay. you don't you don't pay for it in terms of CP, of timing. I see. Okay. Okay. Let me suggest we thank Daniel again and adjourn next door for uh, for snacks. <laughs>